Well, welcome everyone to the, uh, the second uh, panel on today's agenda. We've um, got a very uh, exciting group of experts who are going to take us the next step by talking about how we can best get information to consumers so that they can make um, good, effective, healthy decisions. Um, I'm going to have to start off with a bit of an apology following in the uh, footsteps of, uh, of Michael. Um, I also have an American accent, uh, you, you might have noticed. Uh, it wasn't a requirement for the job, by the way. Um, and, uh, and if he has to apologize for his, his slight bit of American accent, I guess I, I need to offer a fairly large apology um, for mine. Uh, the good news is uh, once we get done here, we, all the American accents are out of the way, I believe. Um, so um, so let's, uh, let's get started. Um, again, we have a great panel of experts. Uh, first up, we have uh, Bruce Neal. Thanks uh, very, very much. Um, it's uh, great to have the opportunity to, to, to speak to you today. So what, what I'm going to do um, is uh, just make a few sort of broad, I guess, high-level sort of introductory comments, um, a few of them that sort of relate back to the, um, the, the initial discussion this morning. And then there were sort of three questions that were, um, I guess, put to us, one of which was, uh, does, does labeling change behavior? Does it change health outcomes? And how does it relate to business success? And then finally, uh, what might be the best way of putting this all together? And so that's uh, the order that I'm going to take things in in the next, um, in the next 10 minutes. So, First of all, I mean, as you all know, diet-related ill health is now the biggest cause of death and disability uh, in this country and indeed in most developed and many developing countries around the world. I hate to say it with Simon here, but it's even bigger than tobacco now and it's getting worse. Now, the reason it's bigger than tobacco is that it affects everyone. Everyone eats, almost everyone eats things that they don't need and that are unhealthy for them. Now, I guess, I think I take a slightly different view to, to, to some of what has been said before, and I don't think that consumers construct diets. Um, I think that what we have in here are, frankly, a bunch of slightly odd people, you know, who have very particular insights, very particular habits, and do things in a way that is completely different to 99%. Uh, of Australians, and I think we have to bear that in mind. What consumers eat um, and what consumers buy is basically what is put in front of them. And I think that we have to remember that when we try to think what the solutions um, to, this, to this problem is. Um, you know, it's not, as you often see, proposed genetics. Genetics might explain why some people do a bit worse in the current food environment than others, but it's not the cause of the obesity epidemic. It's not the cause of diet-related ill health in Australia. Um, it's also not a degeneration of society, where everyone now uh, is just a hedonist, um, doing whatever they want, gorging themselves the whole time. You know, we haven't got systematically more stupid or more uh, irresponsible as a community, I don't believe. This isn't a problem of individual behaviors, and that's really important to understand. This is a problem of massive environmental change uh, over the last few decades. And actually, if you take it one step further back, what it's a problem of is corporate success on a massive scale uh, by the food industry. And um, effectively, what's happened is that as fast as we're getting rid of all our traditional vectors of disease, infections, little microbes, bugs, we are replacing them with the new vectors of disease, which are massive transnational, national, multinational corporations selling vast amounts of salt, fat, and sugar. Now, having said that, I should say I don't blame these corporations for doing that. You know, these are big businesses, they're set up, they're required to maximize shareholder value and profits. They are doing very effectively what they're meant to do. The problem is that their success is public health failure. In fact, it's public health disaster on a, on a scale that is almost um, unprecedented. So it's against that background that I want to talk about what is the potential uh, for food labeling? And first of all, to address that question, can labels change behavior? 
As we've heard, the evidence base here isn't great in terms of randomized clinical trials, uh, looking at the sorts of outcomes that we want to know about. Do different types of labels change what people actually pick up off the shelves, what they actually buy, and ultimately, do they change people's health status? We simply actually don't have uh, the good, ev good evidence from randomized trials. But we do have a whole bunch of other sort of indirect evidence. I mean, the obsession that industry has with what it prints on labels and what will or will not be printed on labels about the composition of foods, I think is a very good indicator of the impact that labels can have in one form or another on people's purchases. In general, people don't eat and drink things that have skulls and crossbones on them. Um, we heard that red is a stop, don't do it. You know, I think there are things that we understand um, about food labels. I would also disagree, I think, with Jenny that the Heart Foundation tick and the GI logo are the way forward because these are great indicators of what's in a food, but they don't change what people buy. I mean, the Heart Foundation tick's been on foods for the last 10 or 20 years in this country, and we've seen a massive increase in um, obesity and all forms of diet-related ill health. If we're going to have a Heart Foundation tick, we need a Heart Foundation skull and crossbones on everything else. That's the only way that it's actually going to work. So I don't think um, that what we have at the moment uh, is, is a solution. Also, from my own perspective, I don't think food switch, which um, I think Michael very kindly put up a slide of, that isn't the solution either. It's been very successful. It's had 350,000 downloads. It has 40,000 users. But there's 22 million people in Australia. And most of the people who downloaded it are weirdos like you who already eat uh, really healthy diets. So that isn't going to fix it. Um, so how are we going to change health outcomes um, with food labels? Well, either the food labels have got to be extreme. They've got to be skulls and crossbones. They've got to be red. They've got to be greens. They've got to have 10 smiley faces. But that's not really what we're talking about in this debate. What we're talking about is not something that's out here bad or out here good. We're talking about what I think is a really narrow range in the middle. And I personally am very skeptical about the capacity of those to really change people's purchasing patterns on a large scale. But what I do think they might do, if we can get them to be just that little bit more extreme um, than industry is comfortable with, is they might drive reformulation. And this was something that was also alluded to in, in the prior session. I think that companies might, if we had a red traffic light for salt and their product was 10% above the cutoff, they might well reformulate it to try and take 10% of salt out and get uh, down to um, an, an amber. They might do the same thing to get from an amber uh, to a green. And if we could could progressively shift those cut points down a little bit each year over the next few decades, I think we could fundamentally change the food supply. And I think that's what we have to actually do, and that's where the real potential of food labels is. Um, if we can use them as a vehicle, not to try to get people to make better choices, but as a vehicle to actually change the average composition of the food supply so that we don't have to go out there and make better choices we can't help but make those better choices because everything um, is just uh, a little bit better. Does this have to decimate industry? Does this have to decimate business? I don't believe it does, no. I think that if we apply it in a mandatory, standard way using a piece of reasonable, responsive regulation that requires everyone to behave in the same way, it's a level playing field. No one's going to win particularly or lose particularly except consumers and public health, which will gain. We've seen in the UK um, a requirement uh, from government to reduce salt levels in food. Industry said, we're all going to go out of business. But actually now, salt levels in food are about 15 to 20% lower on average they are in Australia. And goodness me, all the food industry is still there, and it's still selling food to the population uh, of the UK and making um, great profits. So I don't think this has to be um, a, a, a business disaster. So what do I think we should do? Well, I think we should get something in place um, in terms of food labeling. I think we should mandate it so that it has to be on everything. Um, and I think we should then, again, as was alluded to, uh, look at ways of improving that and modifying that to achieve the public health outcomes that we need um, over uh, the next few decades. Um, on that point, I'll stop, hand over to the next speaker. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much for that, Bruce. Some very um, interesting insights there as opposed to uh, coming at this from the direction of changing consumers, um, changing industry is uh, what's being proposed here. Um, next up, Adrian Bowman. Thank you and, and good morning. I'm not a nutritionist. I have no claims to nutritional experience, but I have had a long history in health behavior change. And I'm going to talk about it, well, my work from that perspective. Also, I'll talk a little bit about epidemiology and try not to talk about physical activity, which is my main area of research. I'm going to talk about four things. I'm going to talk about confusion, then I'm going to talk about campaigns. Then I'm going to talk about information, which is what we're talking about today. And then I'm going to talk about policy. Starting with confusion, science can present a cacophony of realities. In other words, different pieces of evidence can lead you, serious, well-meaning scientists can lead you in multiple directions from their perspectives, even well-meaning and using the evidence base as they distill it. So that when you get to groups enhancing the evidence or distorting the evidence or suggesting we all eat grapefruits 15 times a day, then you can get even more confusion in the system. So that the reality of the information base that we have around food and obesity is a very complicated space. It's a much more complicated space than it was. And you can have, on the one hand, rantings about fructose that make the community anxious about sugar. And on the other hand, tens of millions of dollars spent by the World Health Organization and the Institute of Health Metrics developing the global burden of disease. How much of all of our disease is attributable to a range of risk factors? Moving up the charts faster than anything else is fruit. So fruit intake is healthy according to the global burden of disease, and disastrous according to the fructose intake. Pity the poor consumer, not even the people in this room amongst whom there, are, there is dissent. Pity the poor consumer when confronted with this barrage. You know, eat more carbohydrate, less carbohydrate, more fruit, less meat, more meat, less meat. It's very difficult to get the message right, and it's very difficult to work out where the truth lies in energy balance, in energy intake, and the thing I'm not going to talk about is energy expenditure, because it could be that just sitting more over the last four decades has caused us to expend energy less, and that could be a potent driver of obesity as well. All right. So what we normally do in public health is we develop mass reach, mass media campaigns to solve problems. And firstly, campaigns by themselves only communicate single discrete messages. And what I'm going to show you with respect to fruit and vegetables, nutrition and obesity campaigns, is how mixed these messages can be. I'll also show you an example of a very good one, a very good example, a, a very clear example of a social marketing campaign that worked and why it works. Our mass media approaches to obesity have been many. There's only been about three or four campaigns at the national level. There was uh, Fit Not Fat in the UK in about uh, 10 years ago. There was Don't Get Fat, a campaign in the Netherlands. There was the Piece of String campaign in Victoria in 2008. And then we've had a series recently, nationally, the Measure Up campaign, which was the one about measuring waist circumference with the tape measure. And the swap it, don't stop it. Eric the blow up balloon that said make small choices, small changes, swap big servings for small servings, swap, green, swap a red food for green food, etc. Instead of three ice creams, have one, one scoop of ice cream, those kinds of messages. That's based on the behavior change approach of shaping, which is that you make behavior change in small increments and you evolve a pattern of behavior, you don't suddenly one day make massive changes to complex behaviors like diet and physical activity. They're much more complex than discrete behavioral choices like the decision to go and be screened or the decision to have an immunization. Then we've had other campaigns appear. There's been one in Queensland, Western Australia, and now Victoria, 
the Live, the Live Lighter campaign, which has got the concept of toxic fat, which is a fear-arousing campaign. It's trying to actually demonstrate how terrifying your insides look if you've got visceral fat, abdominal fat, as opposed to uh, other kinds of fat, and how dangerous that is when it coats your vital organs, your heart, your liver, uh, etc. So that's a different approach. So all of a sudden, you've got the fun Eric swap it, don't stop it. You've got the anxious parent measure up worried about their kids and dying prematurely. And you've got toxic fat assailing you every time you open the fridge. These are very different frames for how we conceptualize things. When we get more specific, we do better. For example, the go for, uh, go for two and five, the fruit and vegetable campaigns of three to eight years ago. And even still, we've only got 10% of Australians meeting the five serves of vegetables a day, and perhaps half meeting the two serves of fruit. And when we run a campaign, we don't get to threshold. We can change by those by half a serve. But we need more than campaigns. We don't not need not, not just the message. We need product. We need sites. Is, uh, campaigns happening supported by work sites, schools, policies, and other things. Um, we need things like marketing near schools for particularly unhealthy foods because kids are surrounded by particularly targeted marketing near schools so that there's all kinds of issues in thinking about how we take the social marketing message. But I'll turn to information, which is the main theme of what I'm supposed to be focusing on. Information's not the same as behavior change. The concept of knowledge change, empowering anyone to do anything, is a fallacy that we dismissed 30 years ago. When we used to do that for health promotion, we'd produce a brochure or a leaflet or a pamphlet about anything. And we've moved on from there, and we understand that behavior change is a more complex process. The concept of starting with knowledge is, a fall is also a fallacy. You don't start with knowledge necessarily. You can get people to do things and then they learn why. Or as Bruce suggested, you can regulate, change the salt supply for everyone and they might not even know why they're doing it, but it's healthier for the population provided it's not got any negative effects. Information only approaches are mostly evidence-based as ineffective. In other words, we use Leaflets and brochures in control groups in, in intervention studies more often than not. But industry likes information-only campaigns. And I'll give you an example from tobacco. When I was in my earlier stages of public health in the mid-1980s, Camel Cigarettes invented a cartoon character called Joe Camel that they marketed as an anti-tobacco message and disseminated an information-only campaign to every primary school in the US, almost. Effectiveness, nil. Recall of Camel brand cigarettes, the preferred uptake of choice by every 13-year-old thinking about initiating smoking. The pharmaceutical industry loves Makers of blood pressure medication love to run exercise-based messaging, information only, to patients with hypertension saying exercise, it's good for you, it'll help lower your blood pressure. If they were effective, it would be contrary to their interests. And perhaps elements in the food industry are doing the same thing around many of the marketing campaigns under the information banner alone. Behavior change needs more than just information. It needs a lot of ancillary support of things that happen. Now, labeling is not just information. Food labeling is actually a point of choice decision prompt that you can actually you, you make some, go through some cognitive processes to change your behavior when you see a food label. But that implies what in health promotion we call health literacy. In other words, that you'll understand what the choice is, what the options are, what the information presented to you means, and how to interpret it in terms of the changes that you might make. And whilst that's easy if you understand it between breakfast cereal A and breakfast cereal B, it's not so easy when you're constrained by Michael Moore's three kids running around the shopping cart, when you're constrained by advertising, by product placement, in supermarkets and a whole range of other factors. Um, 
So the conditions for change also can happen in restaurants with menu labeling, or in supermarkets, or in other places, but you need health literacy. Then you need the implementation of that food labeling, and I'll talk about this more at the end. Is it by regulation or voluntary code, and how is it implemented? And what labeling exists? Is it weak or strong? Is it front of pack, side of pack, very small font? Is it the five-star system? How complex is the nutrient message and what proportion of people is understanding it compared to um, um, the proportion that need to? And you get obfuscation of messages. You get these magic substances. I mean, we all know that chocolate is high in antioxidants. But if you market chocolate as high in antioxidants, you've got to eat an awful lot of dark chocolate to actually get enough antioxidant to benefit your cardiovascular health. Probably a 100 gram block a day. Now, if you ate no other fat in your diet, that would be fine. But that's your basic daily recommended level of fat intake. So you've got to balance things up. And that's, uh, that's a known thing, the polyphenols and other uh, elements in dark chocolate, the magic substances in many of the foods that are marketed are even more complex messages. And there's the issue of price of healthy foods. You can put labels on foods as often as you like, but people will buy cheaper foods. So unless you develop subsidy systems, taxation systems for less healthy foods, or actually have ways of queuing behavior, you're not going to change behavior. Lastly, policy. And I was recently, a couple of weeks ago, at the World Health Organization 8th Global Conference of, on Health Promotion, which was on health in all policies. And the frame in which that conference was written was that policy development seemed to be the end in itself. And we can think the same way about labeling. It's very good to develop the schemes, and we usually take five years to develop guidelines or schemes. By then, the evidence has changed, and the decision makers say, well, the evidence has changed, or the scientists say the evidence has changed. We spend another five years doing it again. And what we're missing is the processes of implementation of a food labeling strategy. How well is it being implemented? Which places are using it? Which places are not? What's usage? What's community recall? In other words, how well is it working? And our history of doing this is poor. Our history of actually developing the strategic plans is good, developing the guidelines is good, developing labeling fra frameworks is good, but in public health, we're disastrous at implementation because that costs money and that's politically much more difficult. But in no area until quite recently have we done as badly as in obesity policy in Australia. In 1998, I and several in, in the room were involved in a, developing a document that took two years to develop called Acting on Australia's Weight, a strategic framework for tackling obesity in Australia. In 2000, it was nothing had happened, so the document was put on the shelf and they developed an obesity working party, which worked until 2002. That was abolished 2003 to 5. They developed another set of obesity guidelines. Then they had a change of government, so that was abolished. And then 2008, the National Preventative Task Force, so-called National Preventive Task Force, uh, developed as obesity as one of its core strategies. So we keep on developing strategic frameworks. Now, we could solve obesity by taking the 5 million documents in the storage cabinets in warehouses around the country, putting them in backpacks and getting people to carry them around all day to actually expend a little bit more energy. And that would be more use than our policy frameworks have made. So in any strategy around public health issues like food labeling, we don't only need to develop the framework, we need to take it to the next stage and make sure that we implement it and actually see if it gets to where it needs to go and is acceptable and usable by all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. I'm, um, I'm, I'm quite struck by the, the, one of the important messages you make, which is that implementation <clears throat> of policy related strategies um, is not done very well. Um, on the other side, uh, in industry, and, and I happen to be a professor of marketing at University of Sydney Business School, um, you know, marketing uh, folks in industry implement incredibly well. 
I would have to say. Um, and so there's, uh, so there's a struggle there. Um, and we've certainly got to do better on the public health side. Um, next up, we have Marion Hetherington, and we have the good fortune of having 20 minutes of uh, Marion. Thank you, Donnell, and uh, thank you to uh, Charles Perkins Center for the invitation to address this meeting today. Um, I would like to start off with a disclaimer also to say that I'm not a nutritionist, I'm a psychologist. Um, and the other thing is I'm not going to apologise for my Scottish accent <laughs> because um, I'm actually quite proud of it. Um, and it resisted five years of living in the United States. So um, anyway, um, what I'm going to talk about um, is um, asking the question, what does research tell us about whether information can be delivered in a way that improves choices? And because I'm sort of third in this session, I actually am not sure what hasn't been covered. Um, already there's been a huge amount of information from this morning's session and from this session that tells us a lot about why it's so difficult to change people's behaviours. But I'm going to take the next couple of minutes to talk a little bit about um, the psychological perspective. Um, so... I just wanted to show you what we think about obesity in the United Kingdom. Um, so the government decided um, in 2005 to 2007 to develop the, the foresight obesity um, scoping exercise and then report. And essentially this, this um, diagram shows you a little bit about what the British government think about um, the causes of obesity. And already on this podium, it has been said that obesity is a very difficult, um, uh, intractable, int intractable problem. And Bruce very nicely um, said that genetics isn't that important. Certainly, it's part of the equation, but it's a small part of the equation. And if you take on board all of the different aspects that influence energy balance and in, in terms of energy intake, um, genetics is a very small part, although it's an important part, in the sense that not everybody who lives in an obesogenic environment becomes overweight or obese. Some people, as Bruce said, are more susceptible than others. Now, if we look at this um, diagram, you ask the question, where is food labelling? And food labelling is a tiny part of this overall network of influences on energy balance. That's not to say that it can't work in some situations, it's just to say that it's a small component. And what has already been said on this podium today is that quite often consumers will make decisions based on price. And as a psychologist, one of the things that I study is the importance of taste. So if you make food very cheap, you'll still find that people will trade against price for taste because people want to eat foods that taste good. There's, there's some nice studies done um, on um, uh, choices that people make in the military, for example. So military personnel in the United States are given rations and they will save up their rations to swap for different foods because the military um, is very boring what they get and therefore they will do their absolute utmost to swap so that they can get the foods that they like. So liking and preference and taste are very important components of the decisions made about food. Not all individuals then respond to a permissive environment and susceptibility to obesity and overweight is both social and cultural. For example, lower socioeconomic status consumers are most likely to eat high energy dense foods, cons consume sugar sweetened beverages and have a low nutrient dense diet. So are these components causal in obesity and overweight? Well, there was a recent editorial in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition looking across the Harvard cohorts, and their argument is that these behaviours are a marker of low socioeconomic status. So it's not necessarily that it's causal, it's that these behaviours are a marker of, of lower SES. So consumer, consuming sugar-sweetened beverages, pa patronage of fast food outlets are a marker of lower SES. Health risks, including weight gain, associated with um, intake of potatoes. And as Jenny Van Miller said earlier, there's evidence that French fries, potato chips, these are important determinants of excess um, uh, weight. 
So what is the context in relation to nutrition labelling and in terms of information given to the consumer? We have a growing obesity epidemic across the world. Public health is a, has a focus on prevention, preventing overweight and obesity. And so far today, we've heard it said that the ideology underpinning some of these campaigns is doing no harm. So at the very least, labelling should do no harm. The question is, will it do no harm if you label things with a red light, for example? In the UK, we have adopted traffic lights. Not everyone has signed up to that. But red lights can have um, uh, differential effects on individuals based on um, circumstances. So some people will choose red light foods because they're forbidden and they are dangerously high in calories and therefore quite attractive. So what is the evidence that nutrition information will guide behaviour change? And as we've heard already today, the evidence is quite patchy. Also, labelling, as Bruce said, places responsibility, to a certain extent, if I understand what you're saying, on the consumer. But actually, we need to take a view on the responsibility of industry. And in the UK, the responsibility deal, uh, the public health responsibility deal, has been quite an important initiative in the sense that companies will sign up, they'll take the pledge on responsibility deal. That is, they will pledge to reduce the amount of calories in their foods they'll take the pledge to reduce salt. So for example, these kinds of um, initiatives put the onus on the environment. Um, and industry has, uh, some of them will want to be part of that because of public relations, but for whatever reasons, they will sign up to a responsibility deal. And in doing so, lowering calories, lowering salt, lowering sugar content of certain foods, the added sugar content, they are taking part of the responsibility for the obesity epidemic. Now, um, it was very nice to hear Adrian talking about cueing health behaviour change, because that's something that psychologists know something about. And we've been doing some research looking at what prompts can help people to make healthy choices. And in our laboratory studies, given that they're very artificial, nevertheless, some of the images, odours and um, tastes of diet congruent foods actually guide consumers to making healthier choices. So for consumers who are health literate, which has been talked about before, interested in weight loss, interested in diet in order to manage their weight, there are certain cues which can be used to assist um, making those healthy choices. So using um, images and odours which are health relevant will help people to resist um, tempting foods. But the caveat on that is that those individuals are highly motivated. And Klaus Grunert at our house university in Denmark has shown that attention to food labelling, attention to cues, is partly determined by the individual's motivation. So as was said by Bruce earlier, we're all a bit strange in this room and we probably pay attention to food labels and to, and to food cues because we're interested in nutrition, we're interested in nutrient density and we'll pay attention to the label. But for the majority of the consumer in the grocery store, they're not paying attention to those labels. They are really looking for simple information that's very quick and very clear. And Michael Hiscox has shown with the fair trade label that that's a very prominent label that people will value and will go for, but they'll trade it against price if you manipulate cost. So nutrition labelling will depend on having a nutrition literate population. It's not just about understanding, as has been said. Knowledge is not all that uh, will help in terms of behaviour change. Rather, attention and motivation are key. But there are health congruent messages that could be used to help influence motivation to allow the consumer to be ready to make changes. And partly that's to do with health by stealth. So I think that food industry, will, if they sign up to the responsibility deal, and if they're lowering the salt content or the calorie content of their foods, if the population is not as aware of that, then there won't be the competitive marketplace where you've got one company offering regular sugar version and one company offering a low sugar version. And the, the case in point would be for tomato juice, because tomato juice, or tomato juice if you're American, um, tomato juice 
manufacturers all agreed they had a consensus on lowering the salt content. So there wasn't one manufacturer who had a regular salt version. All of them, as it were by stealth, reduced the salt content of the, of the tomato juice. And as Bruce said earlier, con consumers will eat and buy what is given to them. And so if the salt content is lowered, that will be health by stealth, as it were. So health congruent messaging helps to influence the motivation of the population. Labeling might therefore help influence food choice and intake, but the evidence is not, is not clear yet. And I think we have to remember also in terms of labeling and in terms of food choice, we, ha we think about the, f the food company's responsibility in all of this. As I mentioned, Klaus Grunert, um, who's at our house university, has calculated the amount of time it takes when people are in the grocery store and looking at labels or looking at brands. His research shows really um, strongly that decisions are very fast and they're very habitual. It's very difficult to make people um, change their, their, their food choices because they are, especially if you're on a low income, you know what the family, family will eat, you know what they like, and it's very hard to make those changes. In his research, he says that summary cues are sought. So for example, something that's very salient, like fair trade branding, or something that's very easy to understand and very easy to read. But taste remains, in his research, the primary criterion against which people will make their choice. So how much that product is liked, and that's traded against health, convenience, and price. And it was said earlier today that consumers make choices on the basis of health, but price is very, very important and taste is also very important. So labels can inform consumers, providing guidance on energy, fat, sugar, salt. Health-oriented consumers will seek out those messages. They're very salient to individuals who have a health agenda and that will help to guide their choice. But other consumers are going to be guided by pleasure. They're going to be guided by weight um, interests and body weight interests, and they're going to be in, in, influenced by their circumstance, particularly if it was a lower socioeconomic status family. And of course, as mentioned earlier, in the grocery store, we all have time constraints. Unintended consequences of labeling. There's some research to show that consumers will overeat foods which are um, green, green light. So if they have a green traffic light and they're labelled as low calorie, consumers will overconsume them. Also, um, some consumers will use low calorie foods um, as permission to then go ahead and treat themselves. And you can see that not just in, in relation to dietary choices, but you can see that in terms of physical activity. So the research by John Blundell and Neil King at QUT have shown, and Graham Finlayson at Leeds, shows that when people exercise in a systematic um, exercise strategy, some of those individuals will use that as permission to overconsume. So even with 12 weeks of one hour of exercise every day, some of those individuals will gain weight. And that's because they're using exercise as a permission to treat. Some individuals will eat low calorie foods, but they find them low in satiety. So as Jenny Brandmiller said earlier, satiation and satiety are very important. If you're eating um, low satiating foods, then you might search out other foods by, in, in view of compensation. And as I mentioned, some consumers will seek out the red label foods because they're decadent, they're forbidden. Um, and in the UK, we love that dichotomy of good and bad. Um, and one of the un unintended consequences of putting into so much focus food labelling is that you're, you are putting the focus on the consumer. The question about doing no harm. Um, there are some research, there's some research evidence to show that, in fact, labelling doesn't work. So some labelling, under some circumstances, will actually produce excess intake. So there's research by Boone et al., there's research by Aaron et al., showing that calorie labelling sometimes in, in, invites people to eat more. So I just want to um, end up with a, a couple of examples um, from the UK um, and the US. So Namba et al. have published a study showing that when you look at um, food, fast food outlets who have used labelling in, um, in their state, then what you find is that the offerings to the public improve. 
So again, this, the un, one of the unintended consequences might be that if you make manufacturers and you make fast food outlets reveal the calorie labeling, that reveal the amount of um, calories in a serving size, they're shamed into producing healthier options. Whether or not the consumer then chooses those options is not understood, not understand, understood very well because in those fast food outlets with the labeling, the average calorie intake hasn't changed. Front of pack traffic lights are being used in the UK. It was put into force last month, but not all companies have signed up to the voluntary code and the evidence is not yet uh, gathered. So as I mentioned, one of the key ways to help consumers is um, through health by stealth, that is, by making changes that uh, people are not really necessarily aware of. And the pledges on alcohol, food, health at work and physical activity in the UK, I think provides a small piece of um, hope for the future, which is that when you get industry working together with government, to um, change the food supply, then you don't have to rely on the consumer to read a label and to make a healthy choice. Thank you. Oops. Thank you very much for that, Marion. Some great thoughts there. Um, one of the, the things Marion mentions that struck me is this idea that red lights sometimes can cause people to jump in and uh, engage in behaviors we actually don't want them to engage in. And I think that fits nicely underneath of the reactants umbrella, um, which, is, which is something very important we've got to think about. It's just the notion that people often don't want to do the things that we try to push them towards doing, uh, and campaigns have to carefully balance the extent to which they're, they're threatening uh, and push people in a particular direction. V very interesting. Uh, next up, Stephen Simpson. Uh, thanks very much, Donald. I think what I might try and do in the next few minutes is, um, at least as a relative layman in much of particularly policy areas, just try and summarize what I've taken away from these two sessions thus far. Um, in particular in relation to the question, um, can information be delivered in a way that improves um, choices and hence by implication health outcomes? And I guess the take home message I've had so far today is, yes, if five requirements are met, the first of those being that that information sufficiently well characterises what matters. In other words, it captures the essence of the problem. In this case, the relationship between um, food choices, their nutritional content and impact on diet and thence on health. The second, and this has become abundantly clear from my colleagues on this panel, is that information has to be understood by the consumer and translated into knowledge, and that knowledge can then empower choices. The third thing is that the information, as we heard from Adrian, um, particularly from Adrian just then, um, is that information has to be dispersed and implemented in a way that's effective and actually changes behaviour and can be de demonstrated to have changed behaviour. Another, I, I think I'll add this one in here because it's um, not been raised explicitly, is that the information has to be um, uh, taken by consumers, translated into new knowledge, and consumers actually have the opportunity to act upon it. And that means that they have the availability of choices and that those choices are affordable. And there's an entire set of issues there that I think we need to think very carefully about. And finally, if that information is part of an integrated solution, as Marion just showed very beautifully, um, policy change, um, food labelling as part of policy is but a small part of a massively tangled set of interconnected um, causes and consequences. And a really important take home message is that it isn't just up to the individual consumer. It's not a matter of all of us pulling up our own socks. Um, we need 
the support of industry and government. It needs to take account also of the unintended consequences of a, a change. Even something like food labelling, as Marion has shown, can have consequences that really weren't intended. We need to measure what those consequences are um, and to take account of them. We need evidence on whether policy, when implemented, has worked. I'm going to come right back to the first of those, however, because that's, that's the area where I have at least some expertise, and it relates more to the first session this morning. Have we sufficiently captured the essence of the problem? Um, and I think what we ought to do is just step back and have a think what that problem is. Nutrition, um, as any nutritionist will tell you, requires, and, and adequate nutri nutrition requires that an individual over a, a period, let's say integrated over a day, ingests a sufficient quantity, but not too much, of a, an, an eye-wateringly large number of nutrients. Micronutrients, macronutrients, you can explode your macronutrients into um, their constituents, so protein into 20 amino acids, fats into all manner of different types of lip lipids and fats, um, carbohydrates into different types of carbohydrates. You need collectively to achieve a certain amount of energy in your diet to sustain your um, metabolic and, and physical functions, but you don't want to ingest too much. That's the problem. How on earth do you make that available in a way that can change consumers' behaviour? How on earth do you relate that to health? They're really big challenges, and as Tim said right at the outset, we as nutritionists haven't yet come to an adequate understanding of those relationships. Let me just give you one example. The, the, Na the National Nutrition Survey that was conducted in the mid-1990s here, there was an analysis done on how many people across the thousands uh, of people surveyed actually met all of their recommended daily intakes for all of the different micronutrients and macronutrients. I can't remember what the number was, but it was ridiculously small. It might have been two or three in the entire nation. And in, in fact, if you think about it, it turned out to be impossible to achieve um, simply because getting those, that appropriate balance in that hundred or more different dimensions through mixing different foods, because foods are packages of nutrients, turned out not to be um, it, by Euclidean geometry, possible. Something's wrong there. So what we need to do is to make the problem simple, but not too simple, and I'm paraphrasing Einstein there. What we want is to capture enough about our diet to be able to represent it in a way that conveys useful information when put onto packaging of foods. And if you step back and have a think about it, there's really two um, parameters, I think, key parameters. One is quantity and the other is balance. Quantity we've talked about today. We've talked about portion sizing and, and the like and the difficulty there comes when trying to uh, judge what is an appropriate portion size. If that's difficult, how much more difficult is trying to encapsulate the idea of the balance of the diet? For a start, we don't even know what the appropriate balance is. Even when it comes to macronutrients, we don't know what that balance is. And we've heard the discussions this morning. It's an important but yet unresolved issue. It changes. Both quantity and quality of nutrition required for, for good health changes throughout our lives. The diet of a pregnant mum that will sustain um, most efficient and healthy development of her fetus and then um, ensure lifelong health for her offspring is quite different from that of somebody in my um, stage of life or somebody who's beyond 70 um, and facing a very different set of nutritional and metabolic challenges. We just don't know the answers to these questions. There's a whole set of research questions there that need to be really chased hard by nutritional scientists. I think one thing I can say, however, and this is clear from this morning, is that no single dimension can represent the balance of a diet. And 
That means no single nutrient, no matter how messianically proposed as being poisonous or being um, the, 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 font of the fount of all health, no single nutrient can encapsulate balance because one dimension won't cut it. Certainly not energy density or calories won't cut it, but nor will any single particular nutrient. You need to take account of a balance. If you try and translate balance and an optimal balance into a single dimensional representation, like a star rating or a traffic light, light signal, the best you can do is to measure those stars or those, that, that quantitative single dimensional measure in relation to how well balanced the diet is, or that food is in relation to the diet. And that, that's actually not a bad thing to do. But if you think about it, foods aren't diets, and this has been said today. What we're trying to achieve when we eat foods, if we're thinking about our, our diet, is over a, integrated over a period, for example, a day, if you took all of the food you ate, mushed it up, measured it and its composition and its quantity, that would have some relation to what is a balanced diet. But if you eat a single food, it may be a perfectly healthy food, which isn't the same as that average across the day. But if combined with something that was um, balanced, complementary in, in its balance, the two together would start to allow you to compose a balanced diet. So if you have a measure of difference from an optimal balance, and then you add an extra piece of information, which is eat a varied diet, providing that on average you've got foods that fall equally one side of the balance, the average balance for the day, as they do on the other side, that could work. So having a star rating plus the advice eat a varied diet could work. Otherwise, you've got to take account of more than one dimension. And that raises the question, which dimensions? How many dimensions do you need to take account of to make an assessment or allow people an assessment of where they're going in relation to their optimal balance state in a day? If I'm heading in the wrong direction, what foods do I need to take me back in the right direction? I think there's a whole set of possibilities there that require us to reduce dimensionality, how few dimensions do we have to um, describe foods by, how do we represent balance, what is the balanced relationship, and can we direct people, can we use food labelling to direct their choices such that they can take a journey in a day when they're zigzagging to a balanced diet. There's, there's just some, some, some thoughts. I think the research evidence is suggesting and showing actually very clearly that balance matters hugely. So the balance, simply the balance of macronutrients impacts immune function, the microbial community of the gut, remembering that you're only 10% human when it comes to the cells in your body, the rest of them are a vast um, community of bacteria, many of which live in your gut and are essential to your health and can contribute substantially to your ill health if the community structure is wrong. Dietary balance, balance impacts the rate of aging, it impacts appetite, it impacts um, infectious disease risk and all manner of other things. So it matters and I would argue that somehow we need to encapsulate it. The other advantage is that if you get the balance right, all the studies that have been done both in humans and in non-human animal models um, is that it makes it easier to, to um, constrain or limit total calorie intake. So, when it comes to the other issues, I, I think my other speakers and, and colleagues have, have addressed them in, in, in far more scholarly manner than I can. But we do need to make sure that information translates into knowledge. That comes down to health literacy. We need people to understand the quality of evidence so they're immune to idiocy. We need to immunise against some of the more unbalanced polemic and, frankly, sheer idiocy that you see in much of the popular um, reporting on human nutrition and food. And also an understanding, we need to imbue people with the understanding that evidence changes. 
and that scientists don't all agree with one another. And in fact, it's the business of scientists not to agree with one another. That's how you make a scientific career, by demonstrating that other people are wrong. We also need, as scientists, to own up when we don't know the answer. And as Tim said right at the outset, we don't know a great deal about human nutrition. There's a great deal still to understand. If we're to align our biology and our fundamental biological urges, particularly appetite and the psychological context within which we operate as behaving individuals, if we're to make sure that that aligns with what's best for our health and is able to be aligned with the food production system, industry um, and government policy ultimately, because therein lies, we hope, the solution. And food labelling will be an important part of that. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Stephen. Um, why, don't, why don't I start with a, a kickoff question, and then we can uh, move, move out into the, the audience. Um, we, we've got a... We've got a good uh, 40 minutes of time to uh, get some, some good Q&A, so I'm um, looking forward to this. Um, so you all sort of raised sort of two general ways in which information might improve the, the, um, the health of consumers. One is by pushing industry to, to change its patterns and put better foods out on the shelf, and the other is by convincing consumers in some way to select better things off of the shelf. Um, given that policymakers generally have a limited pot of resources to distribute in these, in these two areas, how would you prioritize them? I'll start. Yeah, please. Um, so I think we've, we've had um, decades of trying to implement programs around health which are basically about trying to persuade individuals to do the right thing. And the challenge is um, from the public health setting is that we end up with, you know, at best a few tens of millions of dollars to try and do that in an environment um, where we're basically up against an industry which has hundreds of millions or billions of dollars often trying to do exactly the opposite to what we're doing. So personally, I think that um, expending more government money, trying to persuade individuals to do the right thing uh, is doomed to failure. Um, I think that we should be spending the money um, on strategies that try to um, change, change the environment that, um, that we actually live in and, and therefore are, are much more directed towards the, um, to the industry side of things and, and, and that space. Mm. Excellent. Other thoughts? Well, I, I would like to just um, add to that that I think that the best outcomes will be when you have partnerships. And I think that if you demonize one or the other, it's always going to be very tricky. But if you get industry on board and they're not felt to be backed into a corner, I think the, that's, that's when you get the best outcomes. But I would just want to also add, in terms of um, dietary intake, that one of the foods that I work on most often is vegetables and they're not labelled. <laughs> so it's not going to help really um, in terms of um, food intake. So I think that we have to um, really work with the consumer to look at plant-based sources in their diet but also to encourage um, you know, those choices by stealth. And the reason I say that is that in the UK we gave free fruits and vegetables <coughs> to children in schools. So every day they have a piece of fruit or a vegetable and their intake was remarkable. It was very high. But as soon as they went into the middle school, where there was no fruits and vegetables made available, their intake dropped. So making it easy, ma making it accessible, and you don't have to make decisions about it. It's just there. And you don't have competing confectionery or other much more palatable foods available makes the choice simple for children. And I think that example could be rolled out elsewhere um, across um, different types of workplace environments, not just in school. Mm. Adrian. One of the issues in the North Karelia study that was a large-scale program in Finland that actually reduced cardiovascular endpoints 
was they did three or four things that were nutritionally sound. One, they subsidized berry growing so that they actually produced price elasticity for vegetable consumption. Two, they worked with sausage manufacturers, not policy manufacturers like the first slide we saw this morning <laughs> from Michael, to actually make sausages healthier in different ways. Thirdly, they got the population to shift dairy products, particularly to low-fat milk, and shift away from, from butter. And they did this in the context of both regulation, enforcement, and industry participation. Because regulation by itself is, can still be patchy in our context, and it's no good having a regulation that the 10% of enthusiastic industries take up. Then you've got the socioeconomic differentials just at one higher level in, in the organizational system uh, perpetuated. The great thing about the North Karelia project, though, was that other Finnish um, regions benefited because yes. everybody wanted to get on board with the, with the project. I think, I mean, a, a really interesting question here is what, is what is the role of industry? And, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. If you can find a duality of interest where you can get industry on side and public health on side, you know, that, that, is, that is a great result. The problem is it's really hard to find in the food space. I mean, I, I come from a background working with Big Pharma where it, it's, it's a dream. I mean, you've basically got these massive industries with massive amounts of money who will give you that money, let you do amazing public health research with it, you get a great public health outcome, and they get a great commercial outcome. And I came to the food space thinking, well, there's got to be this opportunity. But frankly, there just isn't. The margins are too small, and what they're selling, and the way they're making their money, is primarily by selling large amounts of salt, saturated fat, and sugar to make habituating, energy-dense um, products with long shelf lives. And it's really, really difficult to find where that duality of interest is. And, you know, that's driven me to a completely opposite view over the last 10 years, to one where, where, whereby I see industry now, it has to be the implementation partner, but it's actually got to be kept away from the policy table because it's just too conflicted. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather see pharma at the policy table than the food industry because at least there you've actually got a duality of interest that I think you can reasonably expect to work. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a big challenge because, you know, we've seen the government take on the mining industry. The mining industry is small potatoes compared to the food industry in this country. And in general, government is not the slightest bit interested in going there. And I fully understand that. But that's actually what I think we have to, we have to achieve. We have to find a way for government to take um, some, they don't have to be radical draconian steps, but they have to enter the space in a way that is actually going to drive the sort of public health change we need. It's interesting. Industry players um, certainly are involved in, in some of these activities uh, related to better health, um, and they, they put money in there. At the same time, many of those players, as you point out, make a huge amount of their money off of products that aren't particularly healthy, and just by branding those products and effectively marketing them, they're, they're detracting um, and not and, and contributing to the problem. I mean, yeah, the food industry, is, it's very clever. It'll, it'll put money into exercise programs, and, you know, and, and to be honest, that's sort of a distraction. You know, it, it's a bit like you know alcohol investing in um, you know programs against domestic violence, you know, domestic violence against women. It's it, they, they really shouldn't be allowed to do that. I don't think you know it's uh, it's not right. You, you, you know, it's very clever, and I and I fully understand why the companies do it. But I actually don't think it's a constructive way uh, for us to let those industries act in our society, given the enormous uh, health problems we have as a consequence of of this industry. Um. Two questions, two comments from my physical activity perspective about industry engaging in physical activity programs, particularly for young people. It's Joe Camel revisited because the industry that is funding kids' sport is the brand that kids will remember and is reaching a very small proportion of kids and not contributing to population level of physical activity, but is an untold amount of free marketing. So I think it is a distractor to take physical activity as an issue uh, from the way it's, man it's, it's manifest in, in, in kids' sport in particular. But the problem of industry is even more difficult in the physical activity space, because we're even scared to name our industries we're even frightened of actually naming them in public because they're even larger than the food industries. 
for physical activity space, our industries that are creating physical inactivity across total energy expenditure produce motor vehicles, produce petrol, produce the entertainment industries that keep us sedentary, so in other words, produce television sets. And if we didn't drive cars and watch television, it would be an economic catastrophe equivalent to the food industry. So we've got some real tensions between the public health dialogue about lifestyle and the drivers of unhealthy food consumption choices and sedentary behaviours. And to put a, a positive spin on industry, industry are brilliant at behaviour change. Um, that's, that's where the involvement of industry can be most effective. And so then are we, are we saying then there needs to be a regulatory environment that ensures that the behaviours or that the the alignment is, is regulated rather than allowed because no, Bruce... Absolutely. I mean, I right. think that's exactly what we're saying, you know, and, and, I, and you know, industry has sort of a knee-jerk reaction against regulation. And again, I, you know, I understand why industry has that, that, that knee-jerk reaction, but what we have to do is find a way that enables policy and policymakers mm. to, to engage in a debate that would consider putting a piece of, a piece of regulation specimen. I mean, I went down and talked to the, F the Fazans, um, the Food Standards Australia New Zealand Board, a couple of um, a couple of weeks ago about sort of diet-related ill health, and, and this is a you know it's a board filled with a great mix of people from indus you know captains of industry, public health, and I sort of went there and said, well you know really you need to you know you need to put in place some sort of some regulation, and you know I got the initial oh my god what are you you know what are you what are you thinking from the the captains of industry, but actually once you're able to have a discussion with them. You know, we're not trying to put you out of business. We're just trying to set a level playing field here. You know, no one's really going to, you know, gain or lose from a business type perspective. It's just going to actually change the environment. They, they were remarkably positive, and they sort of said, "Well, look, actually, why don't you come back and talk to us about that?" But if you, if your aim, and I think it has to be true, is to align the interests of business and the food production system more generally with those of human health, and currently they're misaligned. There's yep. no question about that because economic drivers. Um, particularly in the food production industry and processing industries, take you orthogonally away from optimal human, human health. That's, yeah. that's clear. Um, the other, as well as regulation, the other primary driver and the most fundamental in many ways is the consumer. So do you think, Bruce, the consumer will have, if properly empowered, from the bottom up, the power ultimately to shift the food industry in directions that better serve our health. Now, there are examples of that having happened, arguably. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, again, I'm, I've got, a, I guess, a particular perspective. I, I see the consumer as a sort of, you, you know, rather disempowered pawn. The victim. Um, well, well, yeah, sort of, yes. But I, I don't see them. I mean, there is this sort of concept out there that industry is providing what consumers want. But it's not. Industry is providing what maximizes the profits for industry, yeah. again, very reasonably, and consumer is buying that because it's so that's where you need to align. But consumers yeah. always buy what they're used to, and that's you know that's why industry are very worried about reformulation because they think that this will be a drop in their market. But if they reformulate together, then consumers have no choice because the choice has right. been made for them. A absolutely right. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Interesting. Um, so, I'm, we have. Give a, hold on, I think we can, get a, we can get a microphone over to you. If I went to your home this evening, Bruce, and opened your pantry cupboard, or if indeed you went to mine, or anyone in the room, we would find um, an enormous range of products. Um, I know that there would be a certain hypocrisy quotient operating <laughs> for all of us <laughs> in the room, but let's, let's be generous and say that uh, um, weird people as we've all been described by one of the panelists this morning, we, there would nonetheless tend to be a basket of food choices that are hopefully in the direction that we would wish to see the community shift, okay? Um, I was on the board of Choice Magazine for, for 20 years and chairman for five. Every month when the magazine came out, um, there would typically be a food category that we, we had tested with our NATA registered laboratory. And uh, there would always be 
recommended and so forth like that. We've heard a presentation this morning about food labelling, some disagreement, but some consensus, I think, in the room that it's uh, a step probably in the right direction. Um, is it so beyond the wit of, of us all to sort of identify from those collective sort of decisions, our individual purchasing decisions, uh, testing by groups like Choice, um, the, the wisdom of respected nutritionists and dietitians, that there may be some companies who tend to appear often in those lists as innovators, as people who are trying to um, get a win with profit, but also get a win with community health, rather than the sort of the horsehair shirt thing that, that Bruce... It's funny for me saying this, you know, because I've made my career in tobacco, which is about demonising an industry for years and years, but, I mean, we all, we all do have to eat. We all are going to always engage with the food industry unless we subsist by growing our, our food, you know, on our roofs or something like that. Um, I, I can't believe that it's going to be as bad. The, the other observation I'd make is that I think I've been in public health about 35 years. Occasionally, a food industry person will come in for a bit of sport, you know, and they'll be on the stage and they'll be snickering and um, muted clapping at the end and that sort of thing. Um, but mostly these meetings are government people, NGO people and academics and very, very few food industry people talking about what they're trying to do when they go to work each day. Um, now, we know what some of the bad guys are trying to do, but there must be some of the, of the good people um, who, are try who have a, a, a confluence of interests with, it, with, with us. Yeah. Comment? Well, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll make an initial comment. But there are, you're absolutely right, there are. I mean, I spend a lot of time talking to people from the, from the food industry and the people who, who work with me do that because we have taken the view that the way to try and make things happen is to work with the industry. I guess that the problem is that if you're a good player in industry and let's say my own area particularly around salt, you progressively take the salt out of your products um, and you take it a little bit of a time and no one will notice and your product will get healthier. One day what happens is your product's actually sold out off the shelf and your competitor's there and they haven't done the same thing and people go, oh, actually that tastes better now. And it doesn't taste better, it just tastes saltier and it's more habituating and it gives you that. But what happens is they spend money changing the recipes, they have to put higher quality product in because they're not putting as much salt, sugar and fat in um, and then end up losing market share. And so, yes, there are companies doing the right thing, but the framework that they're doing it in at the moment mitigates against commercial success for them. And that's why I'm a real advocate of some sort of levelling of the playing field for I, these I key users. I don't disagree. I'm not yeah. suggesting that it should all be done by voluntary decision making within yeah. the industry. I'm not, I'm not an enemy of regulation, as you yeah. know. Yeah. But I think the point has to be reiterated that if you do not do this in consensus, then you will get consumers choosing the brand that they feel provides them with more taste and more flavour. If they're all doing it simultaneously, then they can choose whatever they wish, but the fact is, it's a healthier brand because each of, each of those companies has lowered the salt simultaneously. If you don't get it in, in tandem, that's, that, that's what can cause changes in market share, and therefore industry are not prepared to go down that route. Uh, yes, over here. Yes, thank you very much. It's uh, Geoffrey Anderson again from the Food and Grocery Council. As Bruce very well knows, in Australia we do have an active industry um, program of reformulation of salt and it's, doing, it's to address exactly the point that he made. Uh, many food companies are part of the Food and Health, Health Dialogue, which is a, a federal government um, partnership between industry, between government and between the public health sector looking at reformulating salt. So, there are alternatives to regulation. One of the interesting things about regulation is that we have a very specific guidelines about how to bring in regulation and certain boxes that it needs to tick. Those are that it needs to be, uh, you need to have a clear objective to it, you need to show uh, that it will be effective, that you need to show a cost benefit will, will uh, flow from it. But one of the things that always grabs me when we have these discussions about regulations, and I've been to many fora such as these, is that the people who propose regulation stop exactly there. They say, we propose regulation, but they do not specify how we are supposed to bring regulation in, particularly in the area of reformulation 
for risk associated nutrients. Now the last time we had a debate about regulation um, uh, coming in into Australia to differentiate between, um, if you like, healthier products and less healthier products and specifically about processed foods and non-processed foods was when the GST was brought in. And it was proposed, it was proposed that they put a recipe for bread, for example, into the tax code in order to make sure that bread wasn't included in the GST. Now that resulted in really a farcical public policy debate for quite some time uh, because it was suddenly realised that, well hold on a minute, there's not just one single recipe for bread, there is a whole range of recipes for bread, there are tens of recipes for bread. The challenge of bringing in regulation for foods is that the foods have a continuum of formulations and it would be extremely difficult to go across category to decide which foods should be discriminated against in a regulatory measure. A much better option is the one that is actually being pursued, both in Australia through the partnerships between industry and government and the public health sector, and one that has also been shown to be effective overseas, and particularly in, in the UK that pioneered this work. So, so my advice is that if you're going to talk regulation, you need, if you're going to convince, firstly, the food industry, but more specifically, the government, you need to be much more specific about what you would regulate and how, would, how you would regulate and why you would regulate. And to be quite frank, I haven't heard a consistent and comprehensive and effective argument that ticks any of those boxes in that area. Thank you. Uh, Bruce? So, um, I mean, I've, I've got comments on that. So, I mean, first of all, the Food and Health Dialogue um, has got some great goals. You know, it's set out a great sort of public health objective, but unfortunately it's got a really weak delivery mechanism. I mean, if you look at the Food and Health Dialogue, it's basically a sort of effectively a public-private partnership between government and the food industry with some public health input into it too. Um, if you evaluate that in an objective way, um, which we're do currently doing and will shortly um, publish, um, in two ways. One against what does the ACCC say is a good way to do a public-private partnership, and it sets a whole bunch of criteria. The Food and Health Dialogue falls far short of that um, in terms of explaining what it's going to do, setting targets, reporting, and the like. And that's a big part of the problem as to why the Food and Health Dialogue uh, is not effective. If you look at it in terms of public health outcomes, the Food and Health Dialogue has been in place for four years now, um, and it's got objectives which are about improving the health um, of the nation and reducing diet-related ill health. Um, what it's actually managed to achieve in those four years is to set targets for 11 categories of food for salt only. Not for saturated fat, not for sugar, not for fiber, not for any of the other things that it said it was going to do. And if you add them all up, you find it's basically taken four years to set 11 salt targets, two fat targets, out of about 130 possible targets. And that's just setting the targets. It hasn't actually implemented any of them yet um, or delivered any clear health objectives. So great objectives for the Food and Health Dialogue, but completely hopeless method of implementation. And that's why I believe we need a different mechanism for implementation. Now, you mentioned the UK. The UK has indeed managed to reduce average level salt levels in foods. But to be honest, the only reason the UK has managed to achieve that in a non-regulatory uh, way is because there was a threat of regulation that was so significant that the food industry went, Jesus, we're actually going to have to do this? <laughs> and they did. And there is a lot of concern in the UK at the moment that the fact that it isn't regulated and the government is by no means as, as pushy about this as it used to be, that actually this is going to stop making the progress that it, that, that it has. So I think there is a really strong argument for looking at better mechanisms for implementation than, than we currently have. Do we have an example then in terms of a country that's got it right? Um, I think we have the example of the UK. I mean, you, you, if, again, if you look at the salt space, they have reduced actual levels of salt consumption and they have done it in a non-regulatory way, although, to be honest, I would argue that was as good as a regulatory, a, a regulatory approach. Um, we've seen South Africa just recently introduce regulation, so it will be fascinating to see whether South Africa is able to enforce that and what impact um, it, it actually has. Interesting. Um, right down here at the front, can you uh, tell us your name and affiliation, please? Uh, uh, my name is Yang Kong. I'm from uh, uh, University of Adelaide, South Australia. 
I'm not uh, a nutritionist or dietitian. Uh, nutrition is my personal interest and, and passion. I'm a laboratory-based cell biologist. Uh, thank you for the panel bringing the wonderful uh, information. So I did a little bit of my research in the la last couple of years regarding this nutrition and uh, uh, human health. Uh, it's quite different from what I learned from my previous years. And I would uh, use the, the American uh, journalist, uh, food journalist, Michael Pollan's quotation uh, to, to summarize what I learned. Uh, what he quote is, uh, eat food, not too much, most uh, plants. For me, whole whole argument is uh, really related to the food, uh, processed food, or whole food, or natural food. You know, this, this whole food and the words processed food. Uh, According to my knowledge, once the food be processed, no matter what category they are, even you put the, you take some nutrient out, and even you put them back in, the composition looks similar, but uh, the property would totally not totally quite different. Uh, so it would be possible the process level can be an indicator for the uh, a healthy uh, food sort of uh, labeling, can process level, can be this sort of indicator to, 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 to show how healthy the food are. And uh, also I read uh, some book written by the uh, uh, T. Colin Campbell, uh, who uh, did a, a China study. Also, they also mentioned the whole, whole food uh, I just uh, quite confusing. Well, this whole food and the process, uh, this whole food and uh, uh, processed food, their ratio can be also a, a, a indicator to show whether our dietary pattern is good for the long-term health. I think. In answer to your question, if, if, if I understand what you're saying, is that basically if we shift towards whole foods or if we have on the label some idea of processing and so that we can have an indication yes, of yes. how much the food has been processed. Yes. Um, but realistically, I don't think the, the, the population are ready yet to, to go down the route of whole foods or to go down the route of abandoning um, patterns of, of diet, which include processed foods. So on the one hand, I think, if I understand what you're saying, is that people ought to have more whole foods in their diet, which I, I wouldn't argue with. But realistically, in terms of being pragmatic, we have to try to do our best to ensure that processed foods are as healthy as they can possibly be. Because dietary patterns, culinary skills, and the ability to cook from scratch is declining in my country. I don't know what it's like in Australia, but more and more people are relying upon their foods from the grocery store rather than growing them themselves or even going to farmers markets and choosing foods that haven't been processed. So I think that you know it's great to think about being like Michael Pollan and trying to, to eat really healthily and really well, but not all of us have that kind of salary and not all of us have that kind of sensibility. A small, a small interesting piece is the Public Health Agency of Canada at the moment is actually developing a social marketing campaign around teaching people cooking skills, around teaching people how to purchase and cook food at home, the, these kinds of ideas. And whilst that's only a small step, maybe that is a, a way to start to reframe social norms which have had several decades, four or five decades of going the other way, and it's going to be a long journey, but we have to start somewhere in that space. Another thing I'm not very uh, sure, why this processed food is more cheaper than whole food? They have been, you know, processed in separate way and travel long distance. Why they are necessarily uh, uh, cheaper? All right. I think, thanks for that. Be because they can buy them really cheaply. They can get very, very cheap um, ingredients, and then they can process them in a mass, massive way. Plus, don't forget all the subsidies to farmers to produce certain types of grain, etc. I just want to bring in one group that hasn't been mentioned at all, that I think has a big influence on, on what people actually 
pick to, to go and eat at home, and that's the supermarkets. Because time and again, when one hears that industry, food industry, food companies say they, they can't actually make a change because it won't last on the shelf long enough, and the super, if it doesn't last more than four weeks, the supermarkets will, will take it off. Now, supermarkets nowadays are labeling one particular type of different food, and that is organic foods. All over the supermarket now, there's even organic meats. Can you imagine what that means? And there's all sorts of other organic, there's organic vegetables, I think. Well, they could equally say these are low salt breads, and they put the low salt breads, not many of them, because it's difficult to find them, they're all, all around the back. But I think a meeting like this should actually take into account the supermarkets, because they have a big influence on what foods people are buying. Interesting. Any, any comments on that? Well, I just wanted to say that in the UK, um, that some of the retailers had decided to use traffic lights before yes. government put the regulation, in, or not the regulation, the voluntary code in place. But similarly, with the traffic lights being implemented, some retailers are refusing to do it because they don't think the evidence base is strong enough or for whatever reasons, it's not clear. But I do agree with you that retailers are extremely important. Are there penalties in place for not implementing? No, no penalties as yet, no. Mm. Yeah, I think it's probably a, a, a little bit generous to say that they're not putting it in place because they don't think the evidence base is strong enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think there are probably other drivers and, uh, yeah. Uh, there, uh, over here, uh, affiliation and name also, please. Yeah, Alan Barclay, GI Foundation, Australian Diabetes Council. It seems to me the fundamental problem is food literacy and obviously labelling is just one small component of that, it was that brilliant map that um, Marion showed. Um, and I think talking about labelling, which is what we're obviously doing this morning and, and today as a whole, is just perhaps missing part of the point. I think we should be talking about how we can improve food literacy overall, and I think obviously that involves educating children at school, um, perhaps remedial classes for adults, certainly supermarket tours are something that our organisation does for, for our members very effectively, so it can be done if you've got a strong motivator like diabetes, obviously, but I think we need to be focusing more on that than just regulating and forcing people to eat healthy food. We need to be actually really improving their food literacy. Well, and as a, as a biologist, um, picking up also on what Adrian said about learning cooking skills, the key feature of our natural history is that we um, we go through a very prolonged period of development as a child and we rely on our parents and our grandparents as a social unit to teach us things, everything from our language through to our behaviour and social norms and so forth. When you lose an understanding of food, you've lost a language and you've lost it for three generations. Um, and given that the loss of control of your own nutrition and the externalising it to other agencies gives you a complete loss of control over your health, that's a problem. Um, so I absolutely agree. Um, I, I just want to pick up on that one, one work comment you made about forcing people to eat more healthily. Um, I'd like to turn that around because at the moment I think we are being forced to eat unhealthily. Um, and you, you're sort of talking about government forcing us to eat healthily, but we're talking, I, I guess the other side of that coin is at the moment industry is forcing us to eat unhealthily. Um, and I think that's a really, that, that's a really important point because you know, we are not sitting here um, and the community is not sitting here exercising its free will over what it chooses to eat at the moment. Um, Barbara Eden from the Heart Foundation. Um, I'm talking from my personal stance rather than uh, just solely from the Heart Foundation here. And I just wanted to pick up on what had been mentioned and what Stephen mentioned was around skills. And I suppose uh, health literacy, nutrition literacy and cooking skills and understanding what the food and how to prepare it is an integral part of what we eat. Uh, people aren't going to buy things if they don't know how to prepare them. And then uh, also an integral part is what we eat out of the home. We've been talking a lot, a lot about what we eat within the home, but what we eat in the out-of-home environment, what we purchase. 
Um, I personally have um, a soapbox to stand on with this. I was a home economics teacher in a high school. <laughs> and at the end of the 80s, they decided the curriculum would no longer teach home economics or cooking and sewing to, uh, in secondary schools. I used to teach whole, everyone in the high school got at least some uh, two years of cooking classes in year seven and eight. Uh, I had all classes of uh, 28, 30 boys cooking. That, at the, during the 90s, was phased out and uh, therefore a whole generation of our young ones uh, now do not know how to cook or what even food is. So while nutrition is taught, the skills of implementing that knowledge is not taught. And so if we're going to have discussions about this, then we should be including other departments in our uh, government, not just trade and investment yeah. and health. Thank you very much. Yes, um, <laughs> and just, very, just, very just to, to reiterate um, ex or to emphasise those points and perhaps to pick up on something I mentioned in passing, which is the, the idea of whether people are ac actually able to exercise choice through what is available and what they can afford. Um, I was out at Will Kenya just about a month ago, um, seeing how successful the school kitchen garden program was turning out to be in a township that otherwise had a single IGA stall which was shut for a period because the owner who also owned the pub decided he couldn't be bothered and is currently selling the most appallingly overpriced unhealthy selection of foods. That was it. That was your lot if you live in Will Canyon. And to see the impact that a, a kitchen garden scheme is having within that community was really quite extraordinary. So, yes, I absolutely agree. Go ahead. We don't make public health change without changing social norms and the environments that cue things. It's not just about individuals and individual choice. That's a long-term process for all aspects of public health, but we need to start somewhere and we need to be making sure that we're making progress in those directions. So I think that's the fundamental idea, is it doesn't happen overnight, but if it's not happening over a four or five year period, as Bruce said, in particular areas, then you need to try other things to work towards doing that. Otherwise, the problems aren't going to go away. The next generation of diabetes will be twice as big as the current generation, and the health costs uh, uh, consequent on that will be substantive. It is interesting to note that in, um, in North America right now, quite a few universities have picked up on this, and as a part of their overarching health programs, they not only are encouraging people to go to the gym, but they also have um, cooking classes, uh, and this, this is um, something that's very popular nowadays, and I think it's, it's got legs, and it could, could change for, for future generations, people's uh, preferences. I just wanted to though, put on a proviso, which is that in the UK, Janet Cage has been evaluating the kitchen garden efforts um, around uh, the UK schools, and she's found that unfortunately, even though the children grow their own vegetables, and they know a lot about vegetables, they don't necessarily eat them. And that's because you have to taste them to like them and you have to like them to eat them. And if your parents aren't providing them at home and you're not getting them across your diet, then it's really hard to implement that. So I think it's really important to say that there's got to be joined up thinking. Having a garden, growing your own vegetables isn't enough, but being food literate amongst other motivations and, 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 and knowledge, that will guide behavior, I think. But on its own, I don't think it's enough. Interesting. Probably have time for one, one last uh, question. There's a mic. Ah, over here. Uh, Hello from Sydney Law School. Um, there are increasingly uh, lawyers and scholars of regulatory policy working on this area, and they don't tend to have a nutrition background at all. Um, given the controversies that we heard, mostly in this morning's panel, but also in this one, about not even being able to agree on maybe what a healthy diet does constitute, what advice would the panel give to lawyers and similar types of non-nutrition people trying to, trying to find solutions in this area? Interesting question. 
Ooh. Or do you want me to start pass it on to someone else? Yeah. <laughs> well, That's my the, answer. The, the obvious answer is you've got to find out what a, a, what, what a, a balanced diet is. That has to become a priority and, and we need to be addressing that in ways that are perhaps unconventional and different from, from the traditional. So that has to be running in parallel and I guess in the meantime you take um, as Michael Moore said earlier, you take the status of evidence as it stands and you, and you work with that because it's probably better than nothing. And I don't know, Bruce, you Yeah, can... I mean, I, I, again, I, I think there are, some, there are some things that can be done. I mean, you know, this is sold as a really complex, really difficult problem. But there are actually elements of it which you can take away which are absolutely obvious and blindingly easily, easy, easy to do something about. And, you know, I've been described as a SIF. Um, which is a single issue fanatic. Um, I don't think I am, but around salt, I'm very focused. I mean, we eat 20 times more salt than we probably need for our physiology. Almost all of it comes for processed foods. If you take it out, the evidence is striking that you would likely do benefit, and the likelihood that you would do harm is negligible. I mean, there is, I think, a great opportunity there um, to frame uh, a, a piece of regulation um, if uh, we could figure out the complexities of actually how to do it. And that's certainly something that, that I'm interested in and that we're actively working on. So I do think there are opportunities here. And I, I, I think it's really important we don't get swamped by this sort of, oh, you can only do it for the whole of diet. You can't just pick bits of it. Yeah. Nothing's actually known. That's actually a load of rubbish. There's plenty that yeah. we know that we could work on at the moment. You could take food advertising to children as a specific focus. You could take soft drink consumption as a specific focus. And there are elements that, if you improve them, will contribute to the whole diet. Great. Um, wonderful, stimulating conversation with a number of great insights in relation to how we can go about making some societal changes for, uh, for a healthier population. Join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>